Thank you so much. Question away, question away. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, I found it really interesting. It reminded me a lot of like Oren Cass's work mm -hmm. and Eric Brynjolfsson's mm -hmm. um, tech policy work also. Um, so I actually did research this summer on mm -hmm. a lot of, um, I guess like job retraining, like in mm -hmm. high school vocational work, um, specifically the construction industry. Um, and it was using new technologies um, like augmented reality and virtual reality to train people more remotely mm -hmm. so that they don't actually have to face those associated mm -hmm. costs of moving somewhere else where they may not be that many mm -hmm. jobs or moving to a market. And then obviously the supply of new labor in that area um, being essentially driven up overnight mm -hmm. um, and then the wages being depressed that way. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I have two questions kind of based from doing that research. Yep. One was, um, there was an incredible amount of, or there's a, an incredible lack of cohesion, I guess, between federal, state, um, and regional entities, and then mm -hmm. private entities as well, mm -hmm. when it came to workforce development and job retraining programs. Mm -hmm. You spoke about that a little bit, um, but I don't know if you have like a specific example of how to bring those together, whether it's some <laughs> sort of like repository for skills or something like that, um, some sort of like national mm -hmm. certification program, maybe similar to a European model. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second was, have you, heard of or done any research or what are your thoughts on some um, new technological approaches to retraining and, and tra I guess just retraining workers so that they can be uh, more competitive nationally. So let me just answer both those questions. They're kind of re they're re related. That's why they're bundled together. Um, so retraining is such an easy word for us to say. Here's the thing that we encounter on the other side. When we go to these programs and we offer some sorts of retraining to people, the take-up rates are so small. And we do find effects for those who are retrained on outcomes. But we can't get people in the door to actually figure, you know, to take up on these programs. So how we scale these programs up is a problem because even the local ones have such low take-up rates. And that complicates or confounds our analysis because we can't tell if the positive effects we're seeing from these retraining programs is due to the program itself or because of the selection of who's coming into these programs. So if I was, again, king, which I think about quite a bit, <laughs> one thing I would like to do is try to get some of these medium-scale, randomized assignment training programs where you come in my door and you guys look identical and I'm gonna flip a coin and I'm gonna train one of you and then I'm gonna give you the other one essentially nothing, okay? Or maybe a talking to, hey, go do a good work. Um, and then try to get the effect of the training program separate from the selection. And that's the first thing that I would do before I start scaling them up. Now, if I find positive effects of the training program from these randomized experiments on a medium scale, then you start thinking about how do we scale them up and who takes lead, that's a hard question, but it is one that definitely needs some coordination. How much should be coming from the federal government? How much should come from the state governments? Again, if we found big effects, I would try to think about maybe some you know, subsidies broadly, kind of tax subsidies for types of innovation on these types of programs and forcing people to coordinate a little bit along the way. I haven't thought about it enough because I haven't solved that first stage yet of, of how to do it. Now, if technology works as a tool, with that, which I believe it is, I have a 15 year old and I know he responds very much to technology. If we could get some of those kind of new methods to help with the training, I think they could be effective. But again, I'd wanna see how effective they are in a low, medium scale, not before we go large scale, but a medium scale in, in environment. What do we got over here? Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so you gave agriculture as an example of kind of what we might see in the future mm -hmm. from the manufacturing mm -hmm. industry and its transition with more technology. Mm -hmm. um, currently, agricultural jobs, like you also have pointed out, ha manufacturing is doing, require more education, the, more education intensity. Um, farmers nowadays are closer to machine tenders than they are to farmers. So mm -hmm. there's not many skills they can get that are outside of very specific like agro agribusiness or um, mm -hmm. agricultural training programs at uh, full bachelor college institutions like Fresno State University mm -hmm. to increase their value on the labor market. Mm -hmm. At the same time, just like in manufacturing, the machines that they're working with for all intents and purposes aren't really theirs. They don't mm -hmm. have right to repair. They're incredibly expensive, so they're stuck in this cycle of debt. Dairies mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts, 90% of them are on federal subsidies mm -hmm and state subsidies and haven't made a profit since 2008. Mm. So 
I'm curious, since we've seen, you've talked a lot about what we can do for those who are either leaving or chasing after the few jobs mm -hmm. that are still in the manufacturing mm -hmm. industry. What can we do for the people that end up being these machine tenders in the manufacturing industry? Yeah, so it's a question. And so, so the manufacturing stays, it will never go to zero, just like we did in farming. There is people still in the farming industry. There's going to be people in the manufacturing and low skill. So the question, and this is a tough question, particularly when I start talking my vocational stuff elsewhere, vocational training trains you for the skills that the labor market needs in the short run future. What we want also is people to make adjustments, not only in the short run future, but throughout their lives. So how do we train people to be nimble when situations change? Now market forces, again, if everything was elastic, when these machine trainers in manufacturing or farming are getting lower and lower wages, ideally, they would migrate to another sector, get the skills, and move on elsewhere. The problem is it's costly, and it gets more costly to acquire those skills when you're 30, 40, 50 than you are with 20 because you have entrenched family. It's hard to take off three years of no income to retrain when you got a kid to feed at home. So that is a hard policy. I don't know, I don't have an answer to it, but you put the nail on the head and it actually conflicts with what I, you know, it's the other side of the training of vocational training in high school because if we're doing more specific skill acquisition, you get less general skill acquisition and that general skill might make you more nimble down the line. Maybe not, I still don't know if trig would be useful in any labor market for some people, um, you know, even 20 years down the road. But it is that trade-off, and I don't have an easy answer for it, but it's 100% a question to think about. Okay. What do we got? <laughs> I feel like I'm calling on people. You should queue up somehow, I feel. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm a, uh, I was a manufacturing supervisor for a yeah. short period of time. I'm also a uh, logistics officer in the Marines. Mm -hmm. So my question is in regards to, I know we talked about automation and how mm -hmm. it increases efficiency. But in terms of that there is overemployment within the, the manufacturing industry and other industries, what effect do you think simple logistics uh, observations and procedures that cut down and make things more efficient is going to play in how we increase efficiency versus uh, new revolutionary ideas in terms of automation and machinery and things like that? Yeah. So I'm a big fan of all technological progress, regardless of where it comes from. So if we could get efficiency gains from logistical kind of work, I am all in favor of that. I think that'll happen for time to come as policymakers. The question I would want to know, is there any barrier to that happening? And you might think unions might be a barrier or something else is a barrier. And if so, how do we respond to that? But if not, that's just general technology growth that occurs in every sector over time. And I expect all sectors to be in increasing over that. Competitive forces will help with that. And so policies that promote competition usually accelerate those types of innovations that, are, that occur. Okay. What do you got? What do you got in the middle? I've always taken from the end. <laughs> Somebody over here if you're next. I'm, going, I'm randomizing uh, in different ways. Thank you for your uh, lecture. Uh, yeah. um, I, I, I'd like to ask if you're uh, f f familiar with the works of uh, Duke University P P Professor uh, Michael M M M M Munger. He, he, recently, he recently published a new, I mean, um, published a, a new book called uh, Tomorrow 3.0. Mm -hmm. and which is a, a sharing economy, mm -hmm. and he uh, and uh, he argues that these are and these that, that these are tech, that these tech, that these technological changes when only apply to a manufacturing, but, 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 but will apply um, um, to um, to uh, to uh, the whole e economy as a, as a, as a, as a more entrepreneurs would focus on mm -hmm. uh, reducing uh, transaction costs, mm -hmm. hence people would 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 own less and would uh, share more. So, and so this would uh, result, result to um, um, quite, quite a few people. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, he, 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 argues in, in long, he argues that this is why we should need a universal basic income because uh, there will be much more, um, uh, there will be much more um, innovation and, um, and um, efficiency. And since people are, um, 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 uh, own less, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, he, he argues that we should have a universal basic income to mm -hmm. offset all, all this. Okay. 
Yeah, so let me step back up, back. So technological change and stories of diarism in the labor market, as I kind of highlight a little bit, have been going on for centuries. For those of us who study, the key thing is how people adjust. And suppose we move to sharing economies. If we have our services are valuable and people are paying us, and even if we share a little bit more, we're going to start coming up with new things to allocate our money towards that we don't even know what's going to happen because that's the way innovation has worked for, for centuries. And so my, a buddy of mine always tells a story about you know, telephones. So if we went back in the 1930s and looked at where women were working in telephone, uh, the telephone, they were the people who did the operators when moving wires in those old TV shows. There is exactly zero of those now, even though there was a long time. So technology killed an industry, took it from a big industry to zero. But yet, cell phones have come up, and now we're thinking about Uber and other things and people producing. All of those come in. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The key thing for us as policymakers to think about is what are the frictions to those adjustments. And for me, universal basic income has a distortionary effect of stopping adjustments. So that's why in everything I do, the earned income tax credit dominates that because it's going to give you a big subsidy. I'm going to pay you to work, but it requires work in order to do that as opposed to the universal basic income. And so how do we trade off these distortionary effects versus, now, am I out of time? You're out of time. Uh, I'm out of time. But that was, the, that was the, the key thing in these kind of things. So for me, I agree that they're going to happen. The key thing is how do we promote those adjustments from taking place? And some of those are really hard questions as we're hearing about how do you get these adjustments, particularly for middle age, how do you get them for the young, um, which is where I'm probably much, very much against things like universal basic income because it stops the adjustment process. Do I have one more you said? You can take one more brief. One, one, one more brief. You happen to be right there. That was my randomization. Hi. Um, <laughs> So you talked a lot about people who have a bachelor's degree or people mm -hmm. who have less than a bachelor's mm -hmm. degree. And I'm just curious, anecdotally, we hear a lot about, oh, someone graduated from a small state college and now they work at a fast food restaurant. Mm -hmm. And if you've done any more research Philosophy majors. Shown, huh? The philosophy <laughs> majors. <laughs> I apologize again. Sorry, Josh edited that out. Okay. Um, if you've done or seen any research that's more yeah. micro in terms of yeah, so which... The Colleges and it's a good, there's two, I'm going to answer that in a broad way because then we'll go we'll conclude. There's tremendous heterogeneity in all groups. So I've kind of looked at two, the college educated and the people, bachelors and then less than a bachelors. There's heterogeneity among the less than a bachelors. The high school grads who with no college could be different than the high school grads with some college. They look very similar in averages. The key is, you know, the patterns across groups are pretty big. The patterns within group are also big, and I think that's the point you were getting to. And so then again, is there a friction to adjustment, or is there, you know, I had a, my nephew, he went to undergrad, and, and actually a master's in cartooning. He's never cartooned anything, in his, like for money, ever. Um, but that was, a, that was a path that he took. Now, how do I know, is that a friction? <laughs> what, was, what made him choose that path? as opposed to something else, because his labor market outcomes are very different than somebody who might have went in and chose another major um, or had another career plan going through. So I agree with you, there is variation among that. The, again, as policymakers, we want to think, is there a friction to that choices that people are making? Okay, thanks very good. Thank you very much.